Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much to everyone who is here today. Um, I'm hoping that you're really excited to hear from our speakers today and learn a little bit about what it's like to manage a research project. The way I see managing research is that there are two things you need to do. Obviously, you need to manage the research itself and the project, but you also need to manage the people. Team dynamics can be really complicated. And for many of you as early career researchers, you might be really well versed in managing research, but you might find it actually quite difficult to think about how you manage and lead the people around you. So we're, we're going to cover both of these today. Um, we're going to explore the steps and the strategies that can be put in place to, to ensure productive team dynamics. And we'll do things like discuss the differences between management and leadership, as well as thinking about best practice for keeping a complicated project on track. Now, um, as this is a web webinar, uh, you are free to ask questions throughout and there are there's there's really one good way for you to do this and that's to use the Q&A function that is at the bottom of the screen. If you click on Q&A, what you'll be allowed to do is to ask a question and it also allows you to upvote other people's questions so that we can see what kinds of questions you want answered and we'll answer those over the course of the session today. But what we're gonna start off by doing is we're gonna start off uh, by uh, hearing from each of our panellists one by one. They're going to share a little bit of their experience and after that we will move on to some questions both from me and from you, the audience. So our first panellist today is Dr Natalie Cutler. Natalie is a nurse and academic who is currently working as a senior lecturer at the University of Technology Sydney or UTS uh, Natalie leads educational programs in mental health nursing and global health, and she has a huge range of experience working with both academic and non-academic partners across Australia, Southeast Asia and Africa. She works on community-led mental health initiatives, and she sits on a number of international committees, including, uh, the, uh, including the Worldwide Universities Network. Uh, Natalie will be talking today, and she'll be uh, kicking off uh, with her presentation, which talks about managing the evolution of a project. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here and, and thank you for the invitation. So um, I'm just going to talk about, I've called my uh, little uh, presentation, uh, Managing the Evolution of a Project, and I want to cover a number of topics. Um, but before I do, I'll just say that um, I was the very grateful recipient of, um, uh, of you know, one of the team that uh, received a WUN Research Development Fund grant um, for a study that we're undertaking this year. And um, our study uh, is called, oops, oh, boy. <laughs> Okay, so our study is called The Critical Role of Nurses in Addressing the Upstream Social Determinants of Health and Advancing Equitable Health Care Practices Globally. And we've got um, eight university partners, four of those are from WUN and uh, four are from non-WUN partners. And um, this project has been um, a most remarkable evolution for me and experience as an early career researcher. I finished my PhD in 2021 and um, to be leading a project of this scale is, um, you know, both daunting but also, you know, incredibly um, exciting and, and growth inducing. So the things that I wanted to, to just sort of share with you was um, things like being inspired. So our project happened the project idea came from a study tour that myself and one of the other project team members were was doing to Indonesia and we saw a presenter in Indonesia who spoke about um, the role of nurses in um, the social determinants of health but particularly at the upstream level and so we were quite inspired by that presentation we sat around the pool that evening chewing around the ideas and came up with this project which we submitted for and were um, excited to get. So I wanted to sort of talk about the different ways that you can be inspired to, to do a project where it comes, where the ideas come from and it can be quite an organic process as it was in our case. Um, and then turning the idea into something that others can see. So going from sitting around the pool thinking about what, what could be possible to shaping it and writing about it and, and making and imagining it being real because that's really the first point of 
um, before your submission is your imagination that it could happen, you know. Um, and so then uh, writing the uh, and submitting the proposal, I remember, um, and I'm sure a lot of you will relate to this, I remember sitting up, uh, it, it closed at I think 9pm, um, which was about midnight, I think, in Australia. I can't remember, but I know that myself and two other team members were up um, at midnight finishing off the submission and uh, to get it in just on time. And uh, we were, you know, full of energy, full of excitement, but also very, very nervous about, about it. It felt a little bit as if we, you know, we were, as if we almost weren't ready to do something like this, but what's to lose, you know? Um, so that was that. And then, of course, when we did get it, that was actually, I thought that putting the submission together was all the, you know, that was the achievement. But actually, when we were successful, that was the shock. And um, and suddenly we, we had work to do and, and had to move on and, and get something together. So having a good research team was really important. So bringing the team together and choosing who to be on your team is is quite you know really quite critical and the things that I've learned um as a result of this is um I, I suppose what I the people I chose I chose the person I've worked with um on the study tour in Indonesia because we both collaborated and and generated the idea so it was a natural um in, uh, inclusion for both of us to be there in, in at a leadership level but then um we had other I had other colleagues who had interests in um community mental uh, community health and social determinants and my colleague uh, the gentleman I was just talking about um who generated the idea with me is uh from public health background so I really like the idea that as we're nurses but we're working with public health to to um explore this this particular realm so uh so bringing the team together was really important and choosing the right people and I must say you know as a learning I, I possibly um there's as an early career researcher there's things of course that you don't know and one of the things you don't know is who's got what strengths and sometimes you have to get it wrong to 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 get it right you know and by that I mean um I, I, I naively <laughs> thought that every single person on the team had a great body of knowledge and and skill and, and experience to bring but actually um some people did but some people were just just like me you know early career researchers and were just watching and learning as we go so so having a good balance of people who are learning but people who already know is a good is a good thing i would recommend um and knowing what you don't know so that was that was a little bit uh Oh gosh, I've learned so much just by doing, you know, learning about the budgets, learning about even the databases that we have to record our projects on and the ethics processes and things. So you you just got to learn those things. And um, hopefully once you've learned them, you, you know, you can unlearn them. And um, then this, this point about working to your strengths can be a weakness. I, at the point when I wrote that, it was exactly at the point that I had, um, realized that my expectation of myself as the leader doing everything and and having to know everything was not a viable assumption or not a reasonable expectation of myself but also that I was you know um uh that I was inadvertently stopping other people from giving what they were able to give and so we actually one of our team who is an experienced researcher who was sitting back to let me uh, learn and let me grow she um, came forward and suggested because we we're looking for a research assistant she said you know you might benefit from a, a project manager rather than a research assistant for the scope of your project and um, that was probably the, the the best piece of advice that that we could have had because we brought a project manager on and he has absolutely flown and to the extent that um, you know I've, I've thought goodness me I don't know where we would be if we hadn't brought this person on with the skills that he has and that was because I recognized that um that I couldn't, you know, that there were things I couldn't do and that I wasn't, I didn't know enough about and so on. And being able to listen and let other people on the team bring their strengths. And so that's, um, that's that other, the next point, which is about who on your team owns what gifts. And you won't know it until you 
give them an opportunity to share their their gift, you know. So we we sat um, for a good, I think for a few months, uh, people were allowing me to do the thing that I thought I was doing, which was leading in the way that I thought I needed to lead because I didn't know any different. But now I recognise that, that the best leaders are the ones that are able to, to, to show a solid base but allow other people to flourish as well. So that's something I won't ever um, lose, that that knowledge um, of that experience. And the gifts that the members of the team have have brought have been remarkable and the, the project is um, really, as I say, flourishing as a result. So um, being prepared for the consequences, I guess that means um, being brave and being prepared for some things not to work, you know, or some things to uh, uh, to fall flat or to get it wrong or to, um, yeah, just, just mis miscalculate. And I think, and that's one of the, the real beauties of the WUN um, uh, research Development Fund and, and its focus on early career researchers is that I've felt as if um, I feel I've, I, I, I'm just, you know, really thinking this through right this minute, but I feel really respected as an early career researcher. I feel as if um, the whole process of putting the submission in and getting feedback on the submission and so on has, has um, been really respectful and really supportive of of me as an early career researcher and I'm very grateful for that because that gives gives me confidence but also there are things that I've miscued or, or um you know uh mistimed or something and you, you kind of have to you have to accept that as as a as a beginner as a novice and um know that you've got support around you and and that you you're doing um, that your project is worthy and that you you know if you bring a good team around you they they keep um buffering each other and and supporting each other so then um remembering where you started so we've come a long way since we started our project at the beginning of the year and we are um, we're running a series of global symposiums and and uh you know I've, I've, on my last slide I've got a, a link to to the piece the body of work that we're doing if you're interested to know more and attend um, our next symposium which is coming up in on the 1st of November uh you'd be very welcome uh so um remembering where you started just means you go such a long way that it's really good. Every now and then I see myself sitting by that pool in Indonesia with my colleague with, um, you know, warm beers and talking about this idea. And so I, I really like thinking about that and how, how it become became a real thing. And uh, hopefully I'll have other projects that are conceived around a pool. Um, Embracing the mess. This this is my second last point. Now, this is something that a uh, professor said to me a long time ago that I've never forgotten. She said, um, research is messy and when you're in the middle of the mess, it feels really scary and it you can lose your your you know your your periscope starts to get foggy and you're not sure where you're going. And she said, Don't be scared of the mess because that's where the magic happens. And I really loved that. I really loved that. And, and it stuck with me. And it's really true as well. So when I felt daunted and, and uncertain, I just go, something great's going to happen. <laughs> and so, yeah, so so just I hope you remember that too. And standing on your ground means that you wherever you end up after the journey, you you're no longer where you started. You're in a new place, and um, and that's and that brings you forward in your future projects. So that's all that I wanted to oh share, and then uh, I shall share my um, slide with my details on. If you um, want to contact me, you're very welcome, or have a look at our project. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was absolutely amazing. There was there was one thing that you said that I just want to draw upon really quickly. You said the best leaders find a solid base for others to flourish. I just think that was such a wonderful way about talking about what it is to lead. So we'll draw upon that a little bit later. But thank you so much. Our second speaker is Dr. Calvin Chung, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Geography and Resource Management at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. His research examines the politics of urban sustainability with a focus on green infrastructure and green industries. He is the principal investigator, which if you're not aware, principal investigator is often the term we use for the person who's leading a project. So he's a principal investigator, three projects funded by Hong Kong's Research Grants Council. 
and a co-investigator of two WUN Research Development Fund projects. He's also an associate editor of the journal Asian Geographer. Um, he will be talking about managing a project by leading. So I will pass on to you now, Calvin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me just, I hope you can now see my slide. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you so much uh, for having me today. Um, so uh, my name is Calvin Chung and I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So uh, I have a lot to agree with what uh, Natalie has just, um, you know, told us about uh, her reflection on the experience of leading a project and just trying to add a few more points to it. And I would like to summarize my position, so to speak, with the word lead, L-E-A-D. So um, to start with, I think it's very important for uh, anyone who is leading a project to really learn about your members. And even if you're just a participant, I think that's equally important. Um, so it's not just about learning uh, about whether, what and when they can contribute to a project. Uh, it's also important that um, you can learn about what and when they cannot contribute to the project because there are so many things that everyone is um, asked uh, to work on, you know, both uh, in terms of work commitment and also family commitment. So uh, it's good that we have that whole full picture in mind at the very beginning when we do the planning for how the project will evolve over time. And it's also uh, important and perhaps very helpful if we can learn about, um, you know, possible synergies with the other projects and goals that uh, members are trying to uh, also accomplish uh, as uh, the collaboration project that we're working on will unfold. So there might be chances that we can slightly tweak the, the focus of the project and we'll already be able to achieve uh, more and probably people will be more motivated on working uh, on the project if uh, they can see that they can actually cue uh, two birds with one stone. The second play is about establishing motivating goals. That's the E part of the lead word. Um, so I specifically emphasize that um, goals have to be uh, motivating so, uh, so as not to, uh, you know, discourage people from, um, you know, procrastinating or from uh, delaying their contributions to the project. And there are often times that we have a lot of big goals uh, when we start uh, pulling the team together, uh, you know, formulating our proposal, and we all get very excited about it. But because uh, when the goals are so huge, so large, so visionary, we often give ourselves plenty of time We set a very late, long deadlines. And then people may sort of put the project aside for a while to always realize, oh, it's actually coming up to the deadlines. And it will be very helpful if we can decompose a big goal into smaller tasks uh, that we keep on reminding people of the presence of the project. And that will also make it more manageable for everyone to contribute from time to time. Because if a goal is very big, people tend to think that, oh, uh, it's very difficult for me to start from somewhere. And so we probably want to remove some of the you know, barriers for people to really contribute their, their gifts, to use the word that Nestle has just mentioned a bit earlier. And it might also be helpful if you incorporate some public facing events as checkpoints throughout the way. Um, I mean, people don't want to lose faces. So uh, if there is a public event that requires people to really you know, share their thoughts and share also their uh, progress, I believe uh, many of your colleagues will be uh, very willing to you know, maybe pull an all-nighter and get everything done ahead of that event. Uh, a stands for uh, being adapted to changes. Uh, I believe it's very important for us to be uh, open to alternative approaches. There are lots of I would say pleasant surprises from time to time when you put your hats together and you realize that there are many different ways you can, you know, um, move on with the project. Maybe there are new theories, maybe there are new perspectives that we did not really consider at the beginning. And then so uh, it's important for us to just be open minded because they might actually uh, allow us to achieve uh, better and accomplish more at the end of the project. But it's equally important for us to plan for buffer time, whether to uh, allow for uh, any uh, changes brought about by these alternative views. And also in some cases, when uh, we have our, uh, you, know, um, you know, changes uh, in our, for example, family commitments or other kinds of work commitments. And, and then we'll uh, not 
or in certain go into the panic mode and not knowing how to uh, move on. Um, finally, D stands for uh, documenting decisions and progress. This sounds very mundane, but I think it's absolutely important, especially if you are leading a project uh, that involves uh, you know, multiple uh, uh, members as, uh, from different parts of the world. Um, I have to say, uh, we are more absent-minded than we usually realize, especially you are you know, juggling uh, multiple tasks, not just research, not just uh, you know, projects, uh, that are local or national and or international in scope, but also our teaching duties, for example, and not to say like there are many other, you know, things that we are doing in our life. So uh, it's always good to have, for example, like a shared document that will keep everyone on track uh, about, uh, you know, what key decisions have been made, you know, whether we have changed our plan, whether we agree upon doing something and something. Uh, last but not least, uh, you know, having that documentation is helpful to uh, help everyone to be accountable to the rest of the team and also to the funder because uh, we are often required to submit midterm reports or, you know, end of, um, you know, at the end of the project, a final report. And then and these documents will be really helpful to, to showcase that we have really made progress and we have really been, you know, making good use of the money for various, um, you know, objectives and goals. So uh, I will stop here and look forward to uh, more questions and discussions later on. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Calvin. Um, I love the point about adapting to changes. I think that's so important when it comes to research projects. And as someone who is terribly absent minded and has to write notes everywhere, I completely understand the we're more absent minded than we realise. Yeah, I live my life surrounded by post-it notes reminding me of what I need to do and when and diary pings and things like that. Right, so on to our final panellist. Um, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Alessia Undlov, uh, who is a political scientist and lecturer at the University of Cape Town. Alessia specialises in comparative political economy and quantitative research methods, and her research focuses on understanding the political and institutional conditions for improving development outcomes in natural resource dependent African countries. She's currently co-editing the Encyclopedia of African Politics and she leads a worldwide university network funded project on mining accountability and development in Africa. Alessia is going to talk about lessons learned on building a motivated and engaged research team. So over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Taryn. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm so, so excited to share my experience about, you know, the lessons that I've learned um, building uh, a motivated and engaged team. So when I started, this was my first research project. So I'm really going to share experiences um, that I didn't really know about coming into the project. And unlike Calvin and Natalie, I think what Natalie said about getting a, a project manager is so important because for me, I'm one of those people who have experienced booking a flight ticket, choosing food on the menu, all the way to kind of editing a special issue. So I have really just done it all um, in terms of project management and trying to also be a leader. Um, nonetheless, I'm very happy and grateful for that experience. And I think there's a lot I will take moving forward. Um, but before I share these lessons, I thought it might be important to first um, give a brief overview. So this project is really about um, focusing or exploring how political and institutional mechanisms can improve development outcomes in Africa. Um, and Ghana and South Africa served as our initial um, sort of case studies. Um, the team has a diverse uh, you know, set of people, different levels of expertise from ranging from established researchers to early career academics and coming from different continents. And I think I have all their names there. I thought it was really important to acknowledge each one of them because they've played such a crucial, crucial role. Um, and so I put two different pictures here. The one, of course, we are all serious, boardroom meeting. Um, this is a workshop in person that we held in Cape Town. And the other one, um, it's myself, Kendra and Vivian. We were conducting fieldwork in a rural community, resource rich. Um, and we really got time to spend together. And I put these pictures here because they're really important for the point that I want to make, which Calvin and Natalie have reiterated that you have to know your team. You have to know the people that you're working with. So 
Um, the other question that could arise is, well, Alicia, how do you know that you had a motivated and engaged team? That's the most important question. So these lessons, of course, are based on our progress um, since we started meeting in March 2022. Uh, that's nearly about three years ago. So it's been a while. Um, and I think I've used some of these as indicators of progress. And the first one that I put here is commitment, right? You know, people are engaged, they are motivated to be part of this project when they attend almost all your meetings. So we had consistent monthly meetings with attendance of almost about 80% of the people showing up despite the different time zones. And it's really important to say if you have a team that is coming from everywhere, you know, everyone's time is different. So it's easy to make that excuse to say it's too early for me, so I can't make it. So I'm really proud of that point because it's as a result of that commitment that we're able to have all these other events. We've um, presented our work in different conferences internationally and locally. Um, and we've also established, you know, even new networks um, and met new researchers that we've, we've brought into our project through the special issue um, because of the same commitment. So what are these lessons then um, that I want to speak about that I have learned? And I think the first one that I think for me has been important is really knowing yourself. You know, we lead in different spaces before you can start a research project. You already are leading perhaps in your family, you're the person who organizes the Christmas party, who knows, but um, you already know who you are. And I think that's very, very important. For me personally, um, when I started this project and when I applied, I was still a PhD student. I graduated in 2023. So that's just last year in December. So I developed this project while finishing my PhD. I was motivated because um, I thought there are so many things I wanted to write about in my thesis, but I thought it would take me another 20 years to address all those questions by myself. So I thought, oh, maybe what I can do is they say a good PhD is a finished PhD. So how about I finish the PhD and then apply for funding, have a team, and then answer some of these questions that I'm curious about. And in terms of knowing myself, I generally, uh, I realized through the PhD journey that I do not like working alone. So I, I, the journey was too lonely for me that I thought, well, I'll stay in academia if there are prospects of working collaboratively with other people. And so this uh, Wound Development Fund really provided that opportunity for me. So I love collaboration um, and I also know my leadership style. So, um, how do I know? Just like I said, we lead in different spaces besides, you know, just professionally. I am a very um, consultative um, person. So and that's really been helpful because I'm a person who likes to find out from others what they think, although I do understand that the final decision, if I am the leader, rests with me. And it's important to also be decisive because that's how people trust you. So as much as you can, can consult and as much as you're nice, you know, if people feel like you cannot be decisive, then people will get frustrated with you. Um, so knowing my leadership style really shaped the project. Um, if you prefer working alone or you dislike constant interactions with people, I would say when you apply, consider having a co-PI, maybe someone who is better at the people management so that you can then maybe focus more on the technical aspects or what I call, you know, really the day-to-day -day tasks of, you know, spreadsheets and all of those things. Um, then the second one is about building uh, or to build and maintain a trusting team. So a research project is only as strong as its team. I think you can have the most brilliant idea, but you know, there's a a saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you go with others. So as much as you have that brilliant idea, if you really want to be productive, make sure that you know your team is engaged and build genuine relationships um, because then that builds trust. So early on, we had a, well, a workshop and I preferred to have an in-person workshop early on because I thought it would be great to meet people in person. And I think I also, just like Natsuri um, was explaining, assigned tasks based on strengths. So of course I didn't know what people's strengths are, but very quickly into the project, you realize, I will use this word very carefully, but I would suggest that perfection, perfectionists, if they are such people, they are great reviewers, but not always great at the initial draft, you know? So if you want to get something started, there are certain personalities where you should hand that over to them because they will be very quick to let go and say, guys, here's the draft. 
And if there's anyone who's overly critical, who wants to, you know, who's quite careful, leave that person to the reviewer stage so that they read, critique, give feedback, and then, you know, we sort of fix that. And so that's when I realized that, okay, different personalities, and if you want to get things going, you need to, you know, order the process uh, very carefully. So yes, I managed uh, these tasks. And when I say that, although I consulted widely, I also uh, made sure that I remember the final decision rests with me. Um, the, last, the third point I want to make is about embracing uncertainty and managing risks. So of course, unexpected challenges will happen. You will sometimes miss deadlines. Team members might not pull their weight. Others might drop out. Um, these are all normal things. But I think, again, how I managed risk, uh, risks was to, again, consult, to brainstorm, and to also be flexible. So if a team member can't deliver, and this is where knowing people, understanding who they are and what's happening in their lives is important, that if someone cannot deliver at that point, can you explore extensions, alternative roles for them, but also do not be afraid to replace that role. So I know we are trying to you know, keep relationships, but sometimes if someone cannot deliver and there's a deadline, I think it's important to also say, well, we'll give you something alternative that comes later, but right now, who is available that can help us to deliver at this point? So do not be afraid to make tough decisions because it's part of, of leadership. It's great to be nice, um, to be kind and to consult people, but you have to make um, good decisions as well. So the other one is about celebrating wins. You know, this one is quite important for me. And the reason why I say this is because people can be part of your team, but they're also or might be part of other teams or they might be doing other things as well. And so we need to really recognize the milestones within the team and celebrate those. But I also started my meetings checking on everyone's progress and celebrating personal and professional milestones. Some, some of them had nothing to do with our project because I feel like when people are winning in other areas of their lives, if they had a journal article that got accepted and you know they are excited about it, just sharing that made them even much more motivated to contribute to our project as well. So I was very um, you know, interested in knowing what, how people were also succeeding um, in other areas of their profession. The final one I want to speak about is balancing autonomy and guidance. So of course, each team member needs different levels of autonomy and support. I was the only person, by the way, this is interesting. I was the only person when I started this project who didn't have a PhD. So you can imagine I am here uh, leading a team of uh, established professors and, and, and early careers who also have PhDs. Um, what did this mean? Well, it meant that Experienced researchers might need less guidance in terms of, let's say, their writing, um, but some people might benefit from more flexibility and brainstorming. For some of us early career researchers, when we had uh, writing to do, we would actually ask the established researchers to help us brainstorm um, our papers. They wouldn't need as much support. So it's really important to understand as the leader, like how do you balance that guidance and that autonomy? Um, it's not, not just about hitting goals as well. I think it's about creating a collaborative environment that values both, um, you know, the technical aspects, the writing and research, but also personal dynamics. Um, as I said, when people have a lot of experience leading projects, sometimes when you have when ideas are being put forward, it's not all the time that we agree. Some people might, you know, see things differently. And my strategy was always to say, well, my meetings, the meetings are timed. So if we are not reaching a consensus, one of the things that I would do is to establish um, who are the people with extreme views? And I would actually consult with those personally to understand where they are coming from and then eventually uh, come to the next meeting with a decision. To conclude, um, I would say that I, it's important to really distinguish between managing a project. It is not the same thing as managing people. I believe that people cannot be managed. They can only be encouraged. So what you're really managing is a project. But when it comes to people, it is about building relationships and encouraging them. So managing a project, of course, requires clear struct uh, a clear structure, uh, planning such as timelines, budgets, and you know making sure you have your deliverables, you report to your funder. But motiv motivating people involves encouragement and support. So retaining members, of course, within your team builds consistency. But it's not about keeping people hostage. 
be understanding, don't always take things personal. It could happen that someone is going through a lot in their lives and they cannot just pull their weight this time. Don't make it about yourself all the time, <laughs> you know, but of course be reflective whether you could have provided a much more supportive environment for them to thrive. Um, so we should never really, um, what I'm saying is we should never as uh, project leaders or, or PIs be the reason why people want to pull out of a, of, of a project because we are not supporting or we are not, you know, listening um, to their ideas. Also, finally, I just want to say, because I am a, a, an early career academic, this was my first time, I've learned to be so patient with myself, to be patient with the process to be even compassionate because I also, you know, have made mistakes. I could have done things better, but I've learned that human beings are complex. There's only so much you can control. So the best is to show the most compassion and gentleness um, to yourself. So thank you. I will end there. Brilliant. Thank you. And that was a really lovely point to end on. Um, I think that self-compassion is something that researchers particularly Research leaders often don't give themselves uh, give themselves very much, so I think it's it's really that's a really nice point to end on. So we've had a chance to um, hear from all three of our panelists, so we're going to move to questions now. The one I'd like to start with um, is about the differences between management and leadership. So um, Natalie, if it's all right, I'll start with you since you were the first to speak. Um, for you, what are the differences between management and leadership? Because I think we often use the words interchangeably, but they're, but they're different things. Yeah. Um, and well, um, I think that the phrase that Alicia used, which was so powerful, was that you, you can't manage people. You know, you can encourage people, but you can manage a project. So um, but in terms of so managing to me means, um, uh, you know, making things occur in a way that can achieve milestones so whereas leading means inspiring uh, the people that you're working with to collaborate and um, be committed to the achievement of, of the milestones you know so so there's um, a difference you know one is a, a set of skills that's more pragmatic and the other is is a set of skills I think that's more humanistic and um based on that sensitivity and and compassion really um as alicia said so that's possibly how i would describe uh, managing the difference between managing and, and leading is one's a personal attribute the other's a um a pragmatic skill absolutely and, and calvin how about you what's your perspective on that all right um i think you need to have both uh, if you are really leading a project. Uh, I agree that if there is a resource, then we can certainly bring in someone who is good at managing all the nitty gritty of a project, but um, it's not always the case. It's not always possible for us to have, um, you know, these very helpful people to, to, to support us all the way. So we are often sort of doubling up uh, in being both a leader and a manager at the same time. But I hope I'm not confusing everyone when I was uh, relating man managing a project to the acronym LEAD. <laughs> um, so, I mean, for leadership, I think leadership centers on vision, on inspiration and motivation. So uh, I really loved uh, what uh, Alicia just mentioned about, you know, and encouraging and motivating people. And I, I think that is very important in terms of retaining all the expertise and moving the project forward. And I think leaders also try to create a, a compelling future in order to influence people, in order to keep uh, all the members engaged and be willing to, to contribute all the gifts to use Natalie's words once again. Uh, in terms of management, I think um, the focus will be more on the progress uh, as well as the processes of, of many things that are unfolding as the, as the project evolves. Uh, there are lots of you know, administrative issues, there are a lot of scheduling issues, there are lots of uh, logistics issues, especially if you're really trying to deliver, for example, uh, a publicly facing event. Uh, I just um, led one uh, for the WUN project that I'm helping out with uh, on, on zoning organization. So um, Asa Rose um, from Leeds is the, the PI, but I'm actually helping out with the, the a conference that we have uh, organized uh, in person in Hong Kong 
and there was a lot of uh, logistics uh, issues to handle. Uh, and as a manager, you really want to ensure that all the tasks are completed efficiently and effectively. But uh, at the end of the day, you need both, I would say you need both lenses. So you want to ensure that um, you can get all the nitty gritty done, but that would not overwhelm you uh, in achieving some big goals. But in order to implement big goals, you always need to take small steps one at a time. Absolutely. And um, Alessia, how about you? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I think I completely agree with Calvin that you need both. They, there's really no way that you know you can just uh, thrive on encouragement but not doing the work because the reason why your team needs to trust you they are also trusting that you can deliver so they're not trusting you because you are just supportive you know they believe that you can see this project through um, and I think just going back to my initial point about knowing yourself um, for me personally I'm a much more of a foresight person so I, I see the bigger picture and I see where we need to go and I'm quite aware that because of that I, I might miss some steps. So like Calvin said, um, very good at recording, you need to be really organized, you need those skills of, you know, time management, making sure that you take minutes. Um, and I think uh, just recording where we are and reporting that progress is important. And that's why I say, you know, sometimes you don't have to be uh, the CEO, if you think you can't handle the pressure, right? You can have someone to do uh, to co-lead the project with you at that time that didn't really occur to me that much um i am the pi now but i think moving on next time um given my own personality and the strengths that i have i think i would probably co-lead with someone who's much more of the spreadsheet person you know counting every cent <laughs> um, type of perspective while i'm the person who says well while you count every cent i will meet the people at the airport and you know greet them and say welcome to south africa um, um, because I think that's much more enjoyable, right? Um, so yeah, but otherwise you have to build both. And I think academics, uh, through our PhDs, I really have to say this, we led a massive project because if that PhD was funded, you had deadlines, you had to meet deadlines, you had to have intrinsic motivation. And so there are a lot of skills um, that you've built through your, you know, writing your PhD that you can bring into a research project. The difference is that we wrote that PhD by ourselves. It's a lonely journey or the other person you talk to is your supervisor or supervisors. But in this case, there are people who are looking up to you, as in like the funders have placed that responsibility on you. And so at the end of the day, you cannot be pointing fingers and say, you know, these people were not pulling their weight and that's why things are falling apart. Uh, but that takes a lot of courage in terms of you just sitting with yourself and saying, who am I? Why am I doing this? You need that same resolve so that you are consistent and persistent in the project and you see it to the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I find really interesting, actually, looking at the Q&A is um, that there's a lot of interest among our our, our listeners, our, our, those watching in, in that area of managing people and being a leader. And one of the things that's come up a few times is people have been asking about how you manage team dynamics, particularly if you're working with international researchers, researchers from very, very different backgrounds or even researchers from different disciplines where they might have different norms, different ways of working, different expectations. So um, I'll open it to all three of you and whoever, I don't know who wants to begin, but how do you manage that? How do you manage what can sometimes be difficult team dynamics? Yeah, that I can share. I have another project also, international project that I'm leading and um, with uh, another country uh, who's, English is, is not, you know, a first language and also very culturally different. And so it, it took me some time to understand the, um, uh, the sense, you know, the sensitivities around um, greetings at the beginning of meetings, things like that, you know, that, that I hadn't really been 
you know, I hadn't really understood that properly. And so I would go straight into the pragmatic mode and, and get, get on with things and realise that actually we need to spend at least, you know, five, ten minutes at the beginning of the meeting just checking how we all slept, you know, or, or how everyone's family was. And, you know, but that that's a really nice thing. And so I've actually adapted now and I do that in my own meetings here in Australia. Um, and I think it's a really nice thing. So that was one was just the 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 timing and the expectations of communication styles and then one of the members of the team is a professor and she's a very um assertive person um and and but she's also very respectful but at times she's overridden some of the 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 directions that we've been going in fact also even even kind of reversed certain decisions that have been made and it was almost you know there's a saying ask forgiveness not permission and and so it's been really tricky as the as a as a more junior leader to work with that but I have found a way and and one of the ways is through um humor and and using you know a little bit of humor and, and now instead of I don't take it personally which initially I, I felt quite affronted and felt as if it was a little bit um uh exposing um you know of, of me or I it, it triggered a little bit of insecurity there so um now I don't feel like that at all I just know it as a difference in style and um that she does respect what I'm doing and she res respects other people in the team and and that I sort of just have to keep keep a close eye and keep pulling things back in and and she respects that so yeah um Alessia Calvin anything you want to add um, I think one thing maybe I didn't mention was uh, with regard to selecting the team. I think if you're going to uh, manage difficult team, team dynamics, that starts with who are the team members? How do you choose them? And I think it's really important to have within the team some people that you're already familiar with. So people that you already trust and there's a track record um, of, you know, doing the work, because at least that sort of gives you um, a buffer in case, you know, you are too worried that now maybe you are being undermined or you're not sure. Those people that you trust, that you've worked with before, they know you well, they can give you some constructive feedback to say, maybe this is not what's happening, and then maybe you can brainstorm with them. So I think that's one way I've handled um, stressful moments where I wasn't sure and I felt like we were not really agreeing on something is that I always then went back to the people I've worked with before to say, you know, help me read this. Am I, you know, uh, not showing up as myself? What's going on here? And I could trust that opinion. So it's very important to include people in your team that that you trust um, to help you handle those uh, difficult moments. Yeah. Um, Calvin? Thank you. Um, so I think, first of all, if you are really encountering difficult situation in which you feel that someone is not uh, collaborating with you so smoothly. I think um, sometimes they might communicate things in, in ways that you don't feel very comfortable about or they are being overly assertive. I think first and foremost, it's important for us not to take it personal. I mean, in, in many cases, it might be due to some sort of misunderstanding, especially because we're coming from so different cultures and probably we're also communicating. In, in different ways when we try to express our views. So probably you, you really need to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, clarify if they really mean it, if they're really trying to be sort of overly assertive or uncooperative to, to pull the word that was used in the uh, Q&A part. Um, another thing that I think would be uh, important to consider is Sometimes members are uncooperative or unhelpful because they are not being put in the right positions. So you're being asked to work on something that you're not actually most uh, familiar with uh, or, or most skillful at. So it might be helpful if you just uh, discuss with that person whether it will be uh, easier or it would actually allow uh, this member to contribute more if uh, he or she takes on a different positions. So that, that will have to do with whether you have actually learned them well enough. Uh, so if it happens, just try to see if you can, you can work that out. But if you have tried ad addressing all these issues, do you feel that, oh my God, 
uh, you still have a, a member that you cannot really work on that well with, um, then you, you will have to properly think about, uh, you know, how much you would still want to engage with this uh, person. Um, you might still want to keep this person there uh, as somewhat like an advisor, for example, someone who might still be able to contribute uh, some, um, you know, useful thoughts, but then you will actually have to manage your expectation about how much this person needs to be able to, uh, you know, um, you know, put in efforts for the most important tasks. For example, if you have a, a, a big special issue and you, we are really expecting that person to submit a paper properly, you will have to turn it down a bit. Absolutely. And I think what, what comes out of everything that you've all said is there's, there's a big role around there in managing expectations as well. So I know that's something we often do. It leads at the beginning of we, we run a lot of group based programs. And one of the things that we often do is we get our groups to get together at the beginning of the program and discuss how they're going to talk to each other, how they're going to work. And it's simple questions like, how do you prefer to receive feedback? Some people like their feedback to be quite blunt. Here's what you need to do to improve. Some people might want it to be a little bit gentler. I'm a bit like that, you know, tell me something you like that I did and then tell me how I need to improve. Now, I remember we had one group recently who decided that, that they decided to encapsulate their way of working together in the phrase tactful bluntness. So they were going to be nice, but they were going to be upfront with each other and really, really clear. And actually, they were one of our groups that really, really engaged together well because they'd set out those expectations right at the beginning. So I think it's one of those things that it does take time, but I think it it pays dividends down the line. Um, so have any of you just out of interest, have any of you ever experienced difficult situations in, in sort of conflicts, people related conflicts in the projects you're managing? And if so, how have you managed them, even if it's just something small? Natalie? Yes, I'll just flag there's a there's a quite an interesting question being put in the chat, actually. So I know we'll get to it. But um, um, yeah, I, I think possibly one of the challenges that I'm dealing with, you know, that that yeah, would would be something tricky that I'm struggling with a bit is one of the team members who's quite senior, who hasn't engaged really um, much at all, but has um her involvement is how do I say this? she 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 has a network that is that is helpful for the project um and that was one of the reasons why she was she was you know engaged with as as a person who would be supportive of the project um but unfortunately hasn't really fulfilled that um that role and so because she is quite senior she's a it's a different professor we've got two professors on the team and um so it 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 just it 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 feels a bit like a classic challenge that I imagine other teams experience. And so I'm um, the main thing uh, that I am thinking about is it's learning for the future. You know, it's about who you choose and why you choose them and, and also then getting some kind of overt commitment um, for the, the investment that people are prepared to make, you know, and I do have a colleague who, who literally does ask everybody at the beginning of a project, are you, are you prepared to do the work for the, for the project? And, 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 you know, people can can say yes or no or you know and if they if they don't that's that's absolutely fine but if you say yes then there is an expectation you know and I think that that's um yeah that was just a good learning for me that that not everybody you bring on your team is is going to commit and invest in the way you hoped they would yeah um I think from my perspective it's what we've all the three of us have said about knowing how to reassign roles so my two challenges, I think, have been people um, missing meetings or not meeting deadlines in terms of their deliverables. Those are the two main ones. If you're not going to be in the meeting, chances are you're not really going to keep up with what's happening in the project. And I think maybe to resolve those two things, and I'll use two examples. The one was um, one person was just not making it to the meetings, and then I had a separate meeting with them to say, what's going on? And then I found out that they always have to drop um, they are assigned at school in the morning. So it's, by the time they get to work, it's just, you know, traffic and all of those things. And so then I decided to reassign a role and say, look, 
you don't have to come to all these meetings, but I'm going to give you a role <laughs> uh, that's specific to you. And for this workshop that we will host um, in Ghana, you will be in charge of that, you know. And, and so we had a separate discussion for what they need to do, which didn't have to do with coming to a meeting at a particular time every single month. And that was a success because they helped us organize that workshop successfully. And that's an important role. And I should be grateful that they could play that role. So we won't equally you know, contribute the same. So the second one was just not meeting deadlines. So when we had to draft, uh, write our papers for the workshop, I remember um, one, just not submitting. Again, you, you, know, you take a lot as a leader because now I have to, um, update everyone, but also then uh, have another meeting to say, hey, is there any way I can support? And then I found out that they were quite intimidated by the technical aspects, the quantitative um, aspect of the paper that they didn't feel well equipped or trained to do that. And so what I did was to then say, oh, oh, th thanks for letting me know. I wish you had told me earlier, we're getting a research assistant to, you know, help with the data analysis part. Um, and then you use your skill of, you know, writing, um, you know, the other parts of the paper. And that solved the problem and we got a very good paper. So sometimes I think it's not always that people will always be upfront. Um, we are human, so we won't always uh, come up and say, look, this is a struggle for me. I need resources to be used to assist me. And so sometimes you have to reach out to people because people are different. So those are two examples where I've had to kind of adapt and bring in some support to make sure that the progress, um, the pro project moves forward. Absolutely. And I think that point about remembering that people we work with are, are human as well. We're not all just researchers. We have lives aside from research. I think that's that's really key. Calvin, did was there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just want to um, also address the issue about some sort of hierarchies um, that Natalie has mentioned. So uh, in, in many of the projects that I work on, both uh, sometimes the PI or sometimes as a co-I, I do work with a lot of colleagues that are that are more senior academically. So they could have been my, my teachers in the past. Uh, they could be well-respected, um, you know, um, experts in a particular field. Um, but I think even as early career scholars, uh, we shouldn't feel intimidated communicating with them our own opinions. I think we are too often worried about not respecting hierarchies. But I think uh, the beauty of working in an international project or working in a big team is that sometimes you can actually disregard the hierarchy a little bit, knowing that your colleagues will also respect the fact that we have different expectations because of the different cultures that we come from. So you can at times let loose a bit. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be respectful. That's definitely not what I'm trying to say, but I'm trying to highlight that it would be too constraining. We just keep on telling ourselves that, oh, we are just early career members. We shouldn't be really sort of driving the project. But I mean, there are so many reasons for us to be a, a good leader because, uh, for example, we have the energies uh, as an early career scholars. Some of us who are fresh from our PhDs, we might actually have a better understanding of the latest, the most you know, cutting edge ideas. And in communicating our ideas with those people who we would often regard as at the top of the pinnacle, at the top of the hierarchy, uh, apart from just holding back our opinions, I think it's more um, helpful if we just reframe the way that we express our opinions. Mm -hmm. If you feel that the opinion they're putting forward will sort of create tensions, think about doing that not in front of everyone, not in a you know, whole group meeting, but do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, but if you are still a bit shy of talking about it, maybe bring a friend with you. Like uh, Alicia mentioned that you can have, you know, um, you know, team members who you have known very well, and they can also be the, the you know, the cheerleader. They can also be the supporter uh, who would uh, second your opinion when you may say, oh, yeah, maybe this is actually a good way to rethink about the issue and that hopefully they will open for more room for conversation rather than closing the doors. Absolutely I think that's a, I think that's a really really good point and, and it's often you know I work a lot with early career researchers and I feel like I spend a lot of time telling them you know you're not 
just an early career researcher you are an early career researcher and that that comes with a lot you know you can contribute a lot as you, as you very eloquently said Calvin so we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A about kind of managing things kind of we're talking a little bit a little bit about people management a little bit about project management here in terms of workload you know how do you manage expectations around workload what do you expect people to do how do you keep a clear overview of each team member's progress and how do you know sort of what to communicate when to communicate within your team uh, I think as as Merth, Merth has called it the communication infrastructure but there's quite a lot in that so we could have we could we could handle workload we could handle communication there's quite a lot in there to talk about um Alessia should we start with you this time yeah, sure. Um, so maybe the first one I want to say is uh, we don't develop all these project management skills, um, let's say during our PhD or whatever the case is. So it's also important to do other skills courses. So coming to a webinar like this one or when the university, um, you know, hosts some other short courses around project management, I think it's really important um, to keep, you know, uh, getting those skills. It's something that I've certainly done. I didn't assume that I know all this. So I've had to learn how to deal with that spreadsheet because it's not something that I had to do um, as much. And so that's the first thing, the training that exists, please get as much training as you can. You can never know enough. Um, but in terms of maybe the question about keeping each member's uh, progress. Yeah, I think that's, again, another uh, project management uh, skill that you learn. Um, now I'm trying to remember the name of the chat. So these are more practical things um, to say, do you have all these deadlines listed very clearly and being clear about who has which role? And it is your responsibility as the PI um, to keep track of those. So in my case, one of the important things that I think allowed us to have momentum is to have monthly feedback meetings. So I didn't leave everything to a spreadsheet or to an email. I thought that having a monthly, and these uh, were always set. So after a meeting, the next thing we do is for everybody to open up their calendars. Um, and then to immediately after that meeting, I am sending invites for the next meeting. Um, and I think this uh, kept people, because even though people might not be thinking about the project throughout the month, certainly a week before, a few days before they start, you know, uh, wanting to do the work. Um, and that's enough pressure um, to to get them to to do something. So I think that's one thing I would advise to have frequent meetings, yeah. Um, Natalie and Calvin, how about you? What kind of things have you have you implemented? Yeah, maybe I can make a start. Uh, uh, Natalie, would you mind? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so with um, regards to with the project manager that that came on board for our project, he um, set up quite quickly little subgroups of our of our team and so there was a group to work on ethics there was another group to work on uh, setting up the website there was another group looking at um, a database that we had to had to get find out how to use and um, and so you know that splitting of roles meant that people didn't have to attend the same central meeting every time you know that there were little sub meetings and that they were, um, populated by people who wanted to participate in that particular activity. And so that's worked really, really well. But the as the leader, something that I've been conscious of and been vigilant about is that the risk in that is that some things gallop ahead and other members of the team aren't aware of. So I have to keep making sure that the, the communiques are coming back to the whole team so nobody feels excluded. Um or, or sort of broadsided by by a decision that might have been made, you know. Uh, so that seems to be working really well. And then um, in relation to just managing, uh, you know, using, say, a project, a spreadsheet to manage the project, one of the uh, my colleagues has for she's a very prolific researcher, so she's got a spreadsheet where she captures all aspects of, of every project, including, you know, a column four who's, who's contributed to what so that at the end, because she explained the other day actually that she has had situations where at the end of the project um, and when it comes to publications and things and people, you know, who haven't necessarily contributed, 
but she 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 got caught out once where she didn't have any evidence to support a position she was taking around that. Um, so she's really super vigilant now, and so she gave gave me the benefit of that wisdom without me having to learn it the hard way. So so that was that's a good strategy too. And uh, to go back to that question on communication infrastructure, and also I think there's a related question on are there any templates on, on you know, organizing force and keeping track of everything? I think it really depends on the style of you and your team members. Um, I mean, in the one that I'm currently involved, the zoning urbanization team, so it's just uh, a Google Share Word document. So everything's on it. The first page is the project objectives. So we are always constantly reminding ourselves about what we would have to achieve at the end of the day. And then so um, the, the, the PI ACER is basically including um, all the, the notes, um, summaries of each and every of our meetings in uh, the document page after page. So it's a very easy way for us to just go through it and remind ourselves um, some of the small and big achievements uh, Alicia has mentioned are very important like to, to, to hold us all together, uh, to motivate us to keep on working, but also very important deadlines that are maybe in bold type or highlighted. And uh, I'm, I just look through my diary just to make sure that I'm not meeting my next group meeting, uh, which is going to happen next Tuesday. So thanks for the reminder here. Yeah, that really motivates people to uh, so, sort of uh, focus on that project, um, you know, making room for time and time for that particular project, knowing that you have many other commitments at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the things that, that quite we've got quite a lot of questions about in the q and a is 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 again on that people management element of how do you go about choosing the right people for your team? Now, now this is an interesting one. Because depending on the project you're doing, you might have full and total control over who you're working with. You may be put in charge of other projects where you don't have any control. And there may be things in the middle where you can hire people, but you have to go through a recruitment process. So you may be choosing people you've never met before. So that's, that's, there's quite a broad range there. So speaking for your, from your own experiences, how did you go about choosing the people that you worked with if you had that choice? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, for the project manager that we brought on board, that was recommend that was someone who one of the research team had worked with and highly recommended. And um and we haven't we haven't been disappointed. He he is excellent. So and by that I mean that he um he's obviously done it before. He's got a really good breadth of understanding of research. We we you know, he's paid. For, for the work he's doing, um, but he has elevated the, our work quite significantly um, with his skill set. So, you know, I guess it is uh, word of mouth can be, you know, a really effective way people who've worked with someone and recommend them. Yeah, I think uh, is if I have this choice, uh, I would try to actually keep the team small. I mean, sometimes we get so excited that we can make a lot of friends by participating, if not leading international projects. We think that, okay, this professor has this expertise, this early career scholar has that expertise, and you want to bring them all into the project. Uh, it might sound really good uh, when you're working on your proposal and I mean, sometimes that is actually the way to get you the money because if people are reading the proposal and they felt, okay, you're actually, you know, able to pull all these strings and, and bring all these experts together. So your project must be very promising. But I think what has become increasingly clear in our discussion today is that the more people you have on board, the, the more likely that you will run into some communications breakdowns and also, uh, you know, um, issues. So probably we cannot be too greedy from the very beginning. There might be people you would still want them to take part in your project, but not necessarily in the role of uh, a core member. So mm -hmm. you, you might just want to keep them in the loop, but you will uh, invite them to join at a 
take a lot of junctures if you feel all right. So, um, and certainly there are also cases in which you don't know this person in the very beginning, but once you have a small team built up, you, 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 you snowball and then you realize that uh, they will also have an interest and bring them in for other initiatives because there are many things that we can achieve in the project without necessarily giving them a, a formal role because people may also feel too constrained if they are, uh, are required to, to be fully committed as a, as a co-eyed or, or, or something else. So yeah, it's, it's, it's probably about, um, you know, keeping a, a decent size of, of team members to start with before you also think about choosing people more strategically. Mm. Yeah. So I, um, how I chose, so we have freedom, but we are also limited because WUN uh, requires that for the research development fund, your team members should come from partner universities. So you don't have complete freedom, right? So I chose a base of people that I trust, that I know have expertise in this area and I've worked with them before and then um, began to then brainstorm who, what gaps we have within the team and who would we would add. And I remember emailing even people I've never met just through research, looking at their profiles in the different universities. Some responded, some didn't. So you have to have a thick skin and accept a rejection because it's part of the game. So if no one writes back to you, that's fine. You write to the next person. The ones who do say yes, I mean, trust their yes. It's kind of like teaching. Focus your energy on the students that are in class and not worry too much about the ones that are outside walking around, right? Um, and I think the team dynamic can change sometimes because throughout uh, a couple of months into the project, we realized that there was a particular person that we should have invited. And when we learned that, oh, they could be useful, then we reached out to them in the middle of the project. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and they came in and they really helped the project gain that momentum that we needed. Um, but then for other outputs, for example, I'm working on a special issue that's coming out of the project. There are contributors who are not part of the core project, but who are experts in the area. And because we have gaps on certain topics, I reached out to, the, to them and I said, look, I have this project. We've been working on this would you mind contributing a paper because this is within your skill set? And they said, sure. So that's a person who's not part of the project, but can help you um, to sort of, you know, deliver particular outputs. So this is about, again, flexibility, right? Those that have said, yes, you focus, but also just be humble enough to know that you might need to bring other people into the team as you move forward. So I would say flexibility is quite key. And keeping your eye on the ball, what is the objective? That's what we are following, yeah. Absolutely. Now, something that I'd like to, to just, again, focusing a little bit on people management, we will move to project management in just a little while. Um, we've had a question about knowing your team members and how you build trust, but they make an interesting point that when they were doing their PhD, they worked in a very hierarchical research environment where they rarely reacted with the PI. Now, that hierarchical view of a team is quite a traditional one. Not everyone works in that way anymore. So, I guess maybe I want to ask a more provocative research, uh, uh, a provocative question to you all, which is there a role for her hierarchical research environments or do you think it's better that things have become a bit more sort of flattened? What's your kind of personal preference? I think oh, that, that is a good you... question. That is a good question. It's, and it is provocative. Um, oh boy. I, think that um look you know I think that given as an early career researcher and I can see how much it takes to achieve a status within the hierarchical structure that that is a sort of a, a shorthand for the accrued knowledge and skills that uh, that a person has has achieved right so um there is scope for that to be a valuable uh you know a piece of cap capital sort of a social capital but also just a a, a real asset that it, uh, that hierarchy you've got someone with experience that you can draw um but it doesn't mean as we sort of mentioned earlier it doesn't mean uh diminishing yourself in in response to that and um seeing your, your contribution as as less worthy i think that it's just a different level and, and style so um 
And I think when I commented before about the team I'm working with, where one of the professors, the professor is really assertive and, and sometimes overrides things. I think that in the country she's from, there is a very much a hierarchical structure and, and that the professor is, is you know, not to be challenged at all. Um, whereas in, in Australia, that's not, we are much more egalitarian, but the respect for the accumulated knowledge and skill is still really important, I think. For me, I think um, in any team, we probably will be swinging between the two. So there are times that we want to have a more egalitarian setting, and there are times that we still want a hierarchy. And that also depends on which position you're taking up. Um, so if you are the leader, if you are the PI in the project, uh, and you are working with people who are sort of academically more senior, there are times that you really want a more flattened setting where you can mm -hmm. sort of, um, you know, discuss uh, an issue on an equal standing with those people. Uh, and there are times you want to assert certain kinds of maybe, mm -hmm. it's not like a, a, a very, it's like a, a flattened hierarchy, I would say. So you want to be slightly above everyone because after all, you're still the leader. And there are times that you will have to make the final decision regarding whether we want to make a, a change in the overall uh, approach to the project. And there are times that you want that hierarchy to be established and you want people to, to, to respect uh, you as a leader. But obviously, you have to gain that respect. So it's not mm -hmm. like you can just enforce the hierarchy on your own. So it's, it's, it's really about whether you, you are setting a, a good example for everyone and you are the one being organized, if you are the one uh, who is uh, able to, uh, you know, communicate, uh, you know, efficiently to everyone. Uh, and so I think, yeah, both have their merits, but there are also times that you just want to do away with it a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree, I think, with Natalie and Calvin that, I think everyone is equal but different. And I think that's the basis of it. Um, and the hierarchy for me comes with, it's a hierarchy in experience sometimes and a hierarchy in interests, <laughs> you know? Um, if you can't change that, whether a person is established or not, they might just not have, you know, the same interests. So for me, I think um, what Calvin said was important that an international project allows you to break some of those boundaries um, because everyone comes in and they you know haven't worked with people from other cultures and so they can also observe to see how how are things done right I had my uh, PhD supervisor as part of my project and so if someone is from a, a culture where that hierarchy is quite important and they saw me assigning a task to someone who used to supervise my PhD and confidently so to say you will be doing this they will observe that space and watch what happens and if they can see that my supervisor is quite receptive to the instruction that okay even though he's a professor he's saying all right Alicia I'll be doing this I think that then they get to see that oh is this how things are done and they tend to adjust the other important thing with senior professors for me I think to also be clear to them I was very honest to say look um, there will be a lot that I don't know that I'll be learning I have never co-edited this and that so when you have the time also assume a mentorship role if you so desire. And I saw, I think I was quite lucky that a lot of them saw themselves as core members of the project, but at the same time had the awareness that this is someone who's also learning. And so, you know, they should really be kind, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, that's how I think academically that hierarchy exists. If someone is a full professor, they've gone through experiences that you haven't um, gone through. And what you can do, instead of looking at that as intimidation, rather think of it as what can I learn from you um, in order to sort of get to where you are now. Absolutely. I, I I love that idea of equal but different. I think that's a really nice way of, of putting it, because accepting that everybody brings something very different to the project um, can be a really nice way of thinking through everyone's contributions. Um, so I'd like to think a little bit about the notion of project management in general. Um, we've got a lot of people interested in the notion of a project manager that got a lot of uh, a lot of comments. Um, so um, for those of you who have a project manager, how did you bring on board a project manager and how do they differ from the academics on the team or, you know, in the kind of role that they had? Calvin, did you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, 
I don't have a project manager. I should say I act, I used to work as a project manager. Um, so uh, before I take on my current role as an assistant professor, I was a project manager, at least that was my job title for almost two years. And then uh, I think the ideal project manager is someone who has some understanding about what the significance of uh, your project is about. So uh, that manager should have um, should know at least a bit about your field. Otherwise, it will be very difficult for that manager to actually understand why certain tasks has to be prioritized. Okay, um, so it's not just about whether this person has worked in the academic world or not. Uh, it's also about you know disciplinary affinity. I mean, for example, in my um, in my faculty, uh, a lot of the administrators, uh, they come actually, they graduate from the same discipline as I am trained, you know, uh, as a geographer. So they they really know the topics. Oh, you're actually working on this topic. This is very interesting. Uh, then, mm. you know, as a project manager, you are kind of helping both the, the leader as well as other members to, to, to sort out all the uh, logistics issues. Uh, there are, are deadlines, uh, there are, you know, uh, formalities that people tend to forget when they are so engrossed in, you know, the, the big goals and also trying to get the, uh, you know, academic part of the project delivered. But a project is never just about uh, theories and, and, and findings, but it's also finding, finding, you know, resources to enable many tasks to be completed. And probably as a manager, you, you will have to constantly remind people of, of all these kinds of realistic bits of a project, you know, to, uh, remind, for example, the PI that, okay, actually, there's a deadline in a week's time, and you probably will have to also, um, you know, um, make sure that others are submitting stuff at the time. So you'll be the one who's, you, you know, probably holding the schedule book, and then, you know, sit down and have a chat with the PI and say, okay, have a look. I have noted down all these things that you have discussed in the last meeting. Uh, you know, please be sure that you will also attend to all these kinds of tasks. And then you will probably also be the one that is coordinating communications at times. So uh, if you are sort of working um, mostly with the PI and then a lot of people will be communicating with this PI as well, and make sure that they will actually copy their emails to you. Um, so that sometimes if your PI is a busy person who does not really have the energy to keep on uh, looking for all the emails, then you will be the one who will give them, you know, some soft reminders from time to time saying that, hmm, probably this is the issue that you have to prioritize. Uh, and I find that experience to be extremely helpful now that I am, you know, leading projects because that would sort of, because in many cases as academics, we tend to be at times a bit too idealistic. And then, so the project manager is the one that will actually pull you back and say, okay, you still want to deliver the project, right? So there might be compromises that you have to make. Alessia and Natalie, which is, I can see the two of you both want to go. <laughs> no, no, Alessia can go. Uh, I didn't lead, I didn't have a project manager. I was the project manager and leader, <laughs> um, but I think, Halfway through it, I decided that it was okay. And I just want to share why. Um, I wanted to learn the entire process, uh, logistics, administration. And the reason for that was so that next time when I do have a project manager or assistant, I know what it really takes. Because sometimes I think uh, we can assume that, oh, no, that's not the, you know, the work. That's It's, it's really important work. The progress is not going to succeed without proper project management. Um, but also I think when I look, and I'm saying this based on my experience looking at what we call uh, past stuff or administrative administrative stuff in my faculty and academics, that there's always been this tension. Um, and I think the tension stems from not really understanding what each one actually really does sometimes. Although sometimes of course people can move around. So I thought, let me do this task myself so that next time when I have someone, I can actually know what it really takes to deliver and what challenges they would have to come across. And then I can perhaps be much kinder and much supportive um, to that, to the work that they need to do. Mm. Yeah. And for, for our project, because we did bring a project manager on reasonably early, 
Um, it was a you know re the recommendation from one colleague, and um, we you know recruited this person, and he has really um, yeah he has managed literally managed the the project as we were saying before. You can't manage people; you can manage the project, um, and he has exactly what um, Calvin was talking about. Kept us on uh, focused, uh, structured our activities in a way that that helps us helps it be manageable and because the scale of this um project is is as a as an ecr probably uh yeah realistically i i i i mean i would do as good a job as i can but i think that with the support of the project officer we I, I i said it before the word elevated i think it's elevated the the project quite a bit and so that we'll be able to achieve a lot more than what we originally might have yeah without his support, you know, as a, as a project manager. Mm -hmm. And it's clear from listening to all three of you that running a research project and managing people, leading people requires an incredible amount of organisation, whether that's organisation on your own part or the part of your project manager or the team members. So what did you do or alternatively, what do you wish you'd done at the application stage when you're applying for funding or applying to put this project together to help you stay organised? Was there anything you, you put in place before the project even started? Now I'm asking you to cast your mind back really far. Yeah, uh, so yeah, maybe I can make a start here. Uh, I'm just trying to recall my previous experience. Um, <laughs> I have to say, uh, in terms of uh, filing an application, I might not be the, the the role model because I tend to rush through it. I, I, I know the deadline. The deadlines are usually announced way in advance, but I still put it to the last minute. It's, oh, I have to, you know, get this job done. Uh, I think um, this is more about, first of all, the nature of the project. Um, so, for example, I think in the WUN context, it's very helpful that you have a you have a very a clear template and, and then it does not demand you to actually put in a lot of words. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's easier than some other projects which would give you like seven page of spaces and then you will have to, you, you worry about not filling up each and every page uh, in order to have all your ideas, uh, you know, sort of explained well. Uh, in terms of managing the application process, I, I think, first of all, it's very important to really go through uh, the regulations very, very carefully because oftentimes when you are um, trying to press the submit button, that's the occasion that you worry and then you, you look, wind back and say, okay, did I actually have to do this? Did I actually have to submit an, a supporting document? Say, oh my God, it's not there. So it's very important, especially uh, uh, the more frequent you are applying for projects, you assume that you know all the rules, but actually the rules have been changing all the time. So just working on uh, an application earlier today and only uh, when I was about to submit it, uh, it's a very small stuff, but the team, uh, my I mean, colleague told me, said, okay, Kelvin, it's not that form anymore. They have at a new page. And, I mean, you still ask for the same set of materials. You probably have to play around with new templates. Um, so uh, luckily, yes, you have time to, to make corrections to it, but it's not always so lucky for each and every one of us. So get the rules read right at the beginning. And then probably uh, it will also be very important to, for you to, to, to set very clear deadlines for uh, your collaborator to submit, uh, so for example, supporting letters that, that is required as part of your project. Uh, in many cases, they do require at least a very short endorsement message before you can include that person uh, in your project. So make sure you give plenty of time because, you know, we are all very busy people and you might just not have the time even to write a very uh, quick uh, message. Um, perhaps one more thing to talk about is um, trying to keep um, good filing of all the academic literature that you have actually drawn upon uh, in, in writing up the proposal. And, and because um, you will have already built up a very robust basis for your academic discussions later on, you may want to share that with your uh, team members and, and that will also help build up the, the like-mindedness uh, in academic terms of magnitude. And you know, that, oh, it's actually this body of literature that you have 
becoming so interested about in pursuing the project. But I might have a different set of literature that uh, would interest you. And, and so that would also help you uh, build up the foundation for collaboration early. Um, and Alessia and Natalie, how about you? What kinds of things did you put in place at the application stage? I I mean, I had a different experience in that I, I, I didn't, I was just working on my PhD, like I said, and I was putting notes on the side about what I would do in future. So I think maybe my small advice would be to start now. I think a lot of people are driven by calls for applications and then only then say, oh, what does it want? And then try and brainstorm something and bring people together. I don't think that's sustainable. I think actually sit with yourself. There's no funding call, there's nothing. What are you curious about? What concerns you? What questions you want to address? And continue to work on those. When the call comes, you will see the right one that fits. Um, and I think it's really important to then budget for, for the project manager. Um, also, what we are talking about now is obviously a research development grant. And it's important to distinguish because this one is kind of like a startup, right, that allows you to then moving forward, get much bigger grants. And so we are being provided the training ground and it's important to distinguish what these grants are for because you might get this one and then put so much pressure on yourself to say, I should have, I don't know, whatever outputs. Um, but actually this is to get you to start so that you are more competitive for bigger grants. And so this is a space for us as Natalie um, was saying initially that we are respected as early um, career academics, but we are also supported um, so that we can you know, move beyond this grant. So that's that would be my advice that what really makes a project successful um, is that already before a call it's not the call that drives the project but is that you actually have something you, you want to address that's important for society that is driving you to find the resources in order to do that project yeah, hmm. yeah. Um, I guess for me uh, one of the really critical things was the initial engagement with the WUN partners, um, you know, a range of, of partners and every single partner that I reached out to responded quite quickly and enthusiastically and it was, that was a real boost and then um, we had a body of, of partners that, that allowed us to meet the criteria but that was almost... Um, uh, the pro just the process of that in and of itself was was an achievement and so um, not just a means to an end is what I mean and then having the other partners come on board as well it just felt um, yeah it, 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 I think that's set set the scene very well for a for a good pro a project that had stability and um, in, engagement I think one of the things that, that often academics don't realise, particularly at an early career stage when they're planning a project, is just how long it takes and just how much pre-thinking you have to do before you even start. Um, so Calvin, I completely understand that, oh my gosh, there's a deadline, I need to get there immediately. But if you can, like like Alessia and Natalie, you know, really think ahead. One, one of the things I often recommend to people is to keep a kind of big ideas document on your computer or in a file somewhere if you prefer to write on paper where every time you have a big idea an exciting idea you write it down and then when it comes to these calls you've got something to start with it also helps because if you're anything like me you'll have a great idea you won't write it down and then you'll have forgotten it 24 hours later so it's always good to keep a record of these things I tend to keep these these documents open when I'm at conferences and things like that. When I hear other people speak, it often gets the, the connections firing in my brain and I get my best ideas there. And so that's what I tend, tend to do, that kind of thing. And that can be really, really helpful. Um, it can be it can be tough, though, you know, uh, being organised in advance. Um, so with that in mind, are there any particular tools that the three of you recommend for keeping yourself organised or any particular little things that have really helped you stay on top of your projects? I think for me it's, it's quite simple. So I make sure that uh, my um, calendar on the phone uh, is synchronized with the one on my email. Um, so I, I want to make sure that I, I have all the you know, meetings and, 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 and deadlines, you know, uh, included in the calendar, so I'm not really missing any deadlines. 
I might be procrastinating, but I'm definitely not missing it. I'll make sure that I'll get it done before the deadlines. Uh, so that that's one thing. Um, I mean, there are people who are are more meticulous with with you know uh, you know formatting and whatsoever. But I I think it has to really suit you. So for me, I I don't really care. I just need a word document and a calendar, and that's it. Yeah. Um, I've got I've got a simple one as well that helps for my brain um, and it's you know in relation to minutes and and taking minutes and so sometimes you can have minutes for each meeting on se separate documents or you can have a, a what we call contemporaneous sort of seven minutes that um, starts from uh, you know that 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 that's yeah that, that has the oldest information first and then moves moves down but I actually do it in reverse so I put the the, the old information continually moves towards the bottom of the the document and it's and it's a cumulative progressive or iterative document and the most current information is always at the top and so I've I've actually found that a really great way to do it for for myself but it also means that we have a, a record in one place of progress and um yeah so I quite enjoy doing that and always the most current information is right at the top and then you add to that so uh for me I realized uh, these past few years that um whenever the year begins it looks like it's a clean slate wow look at this exciting I can do so much but I realized that actually a lot of things are predictable so Grant calls are predictable. Uh, when you apply for promotion is predictable. <laughs> it never really changes. Uh, your teaching is predictable. So what I've learned to do is to say, okay, what exactly do I know already about how this year is going to play out? And what I do is I schedule those things beginning of the year. So if I know that I uh, this is exam time, I will block that out uh, and say marking exams for that two weeks, even though it's in June. And the reason for this is to avoid jumping into things because June looks empty. So I say yes to something in April because my June looks like it has nothing. So I find that beginning of the year, I say, okay, what is the goal here? If it's to really apply for funding this year, when is the call coming? So if I know it's end of October, it means leading up a few weeks before that, I'd probably have to be working on this funding. So I cannot take other bigger projects. So I think for me, that's maybe the one advice I could give is to actually schedule the predictable things ahead of time and if it is a journal article don't just write the deadline and say it's 31 september submit to journal no when are you writing it <laughs> so schedule the writing of the paper leading up to the submission uh, because otherwise you just wake up and say oh the deadline is tomorrow but like there isn't enough time to write um so yes i think that's one thing i've learned um over time to really schedule the small time not the deadline but what needs to be done and when you would write that application, for example. Yeah, I agree. That's what I'm doing more frequently these days, just to avoid me from being the deadline fighter, so to speak. Yeah, one of one of the things that uh, I like to do because I love working to a deadline, there's nothing that gets me motivated like a deadline, but I set myself fake early deadlines that are actually about two weeks before I need to get the thing done. and. It's really surprising. I know they're not real deadlines, but it works for me. I've got that thing in my diary. I know I need to meet that deadline. And then it gives me time to work on whatever I'm doing. What, what I'm hearing from you all there is actually what you do is, is fairly low tech. You know, you don't, you're not needing to use complicated bits of software or technology. It's just simple little things like, you know, aligning your calendars, booking in deadlines far in advance. And Actually, something that, um, Alessia, you just mentioned as well is that I, I think a lot of people really struggle with is how to say no to things, because that is often what leads to our workload is the inability to say, actually, I haven't got time for that right now. So when you're, when you're managing a project, actually, many exciting things can come up and there can be many potential paths and avenues in front of you. So how do you manage that? You know, are you are you all the kind of people who say yes to everything or how do you manage saying no if, if you do? Um, Alessia, would you like to start as you've already talked about it a little bit? And I think the, the strategy that I use is exactly what allows me to say no, because I have a reason for saying no, that's sorry, that's, I'll have, a, I'll be writing a grant proposal, so I really cannot 
do anything. But I think the power in the no is that when you say yes to something, you're already saying no to something else. And I think it's really important to remember that. And I'm a person that says, if I'm going to say yes, I will commit. So not even with just work, even being invited to someone's birthday party, I will say yes. And then when it's the day to go there on a Saturday and I'm feeling tired, I'm like, oh, I wish I never said yes. But because I honor and respect my yes, I actually just pull myself out and now I have to go there. So I have to think about it that because I'm a person who commits and when I say yes, I mean it, I think about the, you know, the stress that I have to go through having to go there. So I just end up saying no, because I know myself, I'm not going to change my mind. Once I've said yes, I will come through. But there are many people who say yes a lot. And I think we need to address that. Say yes, and then change your mind halfway through the project or two days before say, oh, sorry, you know, I didn't realize. And I think that's even worse, <laughs> you know. So I think you'd rather say no, I don't have the time for this. And then maybe if it does happen, don't have a fear of missing out. If it does happen that your calendar opens up, you reach out to the person and say, oh, by the way, I thought I couldn't do this. But now my time has opened up. Is it okay if I can still, you know, work with you? That's much more responsible. So for me, I think it's really a respect issue um, and just a commitment issue that if you know yourself and you mean your yeses, you will say more no's. <laughs> it is challenging, though, as an early career researcher, because um, there's a there is a sense of needing to establish yourself and, um, you know, be connected into projects that are that are going, you know, the leading or or um, just being a member of the team. Um, and so, and and including things like uh, PhD supervision, honours supervision and that, that, that don't really lead, well, they sort of, they, it's different to leading a, a, a pro, leading a project yourself, um, but it takes up time. And so I do feel that um, there's a, a, almost a cultural, academic cultural expectation that, you're a bottomless pit, you know, that you can actually continually absorb more work. And um, and obviously that's not true and it's problematic, but it can be tricky to know which opportunities are the ones to say no to, you know, I've, I've found that myself. Um, I think it's important, just like when you're trying to recruit your team members that you learn from whoever that is inviting you to join a project what are you expecting of me when do you expect me to contribute to the project is that going to really coincide with times that i am already sort of heavily committed to whatever administrative or academic task it might be and so it's uh it's actually respectful to people if you are you know, having clarified everything and say, no, I'm sorry, I'm really interested in that, but I don't want to be a burden so if I later on cannot commit as much as I wish. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I believe uh, if people approach you in the first case, they probably will find that you are someone who is uh, of value to the project and you might mm -hmm. still be able to sort of keep in contact with these, um, you know, people and, and see if there are, you know, opportunities for further collaboration. I mean, we have mentioned today that there are also occasions you want an additional advisor, you want someone to work in the uh, special issue. And when you see that and say, hey, yeah, we actually talk about it, um, you know, maybe a year ago, I'm really getting more available now. Maybe I can also make some contributions. As long as you don't mind that you are not necessarily earning the title because there are people who are title collectors they just want their name to appear on each and everything and probably as early career scholars we feel the urge because maybe it's our university that's asking us to do that you want to look good on your cv so that when you get to the next stage uh if you're trying to apply for getting to the next stage of the career you have something to brag about but i think it's important that you're also managing your reputation as someone who is mm -hmm. reliable and responsible because the more you're committed to the more likely that you mm -hmm. will screw something up along the way so yeah I, I sometimes we have to be a bit more calculated but I'm saying this term in a, in a positive way I mean in in terms of managing and you know healthy and respectful collaboration with other people in the academic world Mm. 
And I really like that positioning of of managing your workload as a point of respect for other people as well. I think that's a really nice way to to think about it because I think I can speak for at least for the UK context. Funders are increasingly and and actually universities as, as well are increasingly moving to a model where we want researchers to demonstrate quality over quantity. So we are less interested in you being able to produce huge amounts of work and more interested in your in, in the quality of what you're producing. So there is starting to be a shift there. I am absolutely terrible for saying yes to everything because there are so many exciting opportunities and someone will email me and go, do you want to do this? And I go, oh, fantastic. Absolutely. And then I'm overloaded. And the thing I've had to learn over the years is that's not serving everybody um, and anybody if I'm overloaded and can't give 100 percent to everything that I'm working on. So I thought, I know I'm not a panellist, but I thought I'd share a little bit, bit of advice from my boss, who was telling me off for this recently, as she was very right to. She said, remember that you're at an early point in your career. You have your entire career ahead of you to do all of these things and say yes to these things. And so she taught me a technique which I found really useful, actually, which she says, if you can't say no, say not right now. So you can kind of do what Calvin suggested. You say, look, I just don't have the capacity right now to do this, but this sounds absolutely fascinating. Let me know if you're doing this again in six months, a year, or let me know what happens and I'll see if I can get involved at a later stage. That way it feels like you're not shutting a door, you're leaving it ajar, leaving that opportunity open for other people. Mm -hmm. um, so we are coming towards the end of the session. I'd just like to finish by asking one more question. And that is, if you could start your projects all over again is there anything that you would do differently or are you completely happy with how it's all gone <laughs> ending on ending on a tough one there um i i would probably hand pick my team a little bit more consciously um, yeah, just uh, and perhaps have a couple of more people with particular strengths um, where there are s s gaps at the moment, yeah. I will say I don't regret um, joining the, uh, the WUN project that I'm now working in or the one that I also was involved in. Um, um, a year ago uh, on um, you know net zero old, um, you know cities um, but one thing that I would certainly do differently is to be uh, more careful in as I just mentioned earlier more careful about gauging how much you have to commit in the project because um, you know, there are also very exciting possibilities coming up later on that you don't know. Um, and so you always want to make sure that you still leave yourself with a bit of flexibility and taking on more stuff uh, later on. Uh, and, then, and then you will need that very uh, a clear and straightforward conversation with your, your leader or your, 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 your collaborators that, hey, this is what I can do. And, and there might be occasions that I might not be able to, to commit. Uh, but so far, I, I would say my uh, experience in working on the WN projects has been really good. I think WN has really pulled together a great range of institutions. I have been meeting a lot of you know, great and, and supportive people. So I'm definitely not going to say, okay, if you could start the project all over again the answer is to say oh don't commit to that project no 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 you should be there but it's, it's just about making sure that you know how much you can commit uh, when you can commit and, and and make it clear to everyone else sure what would i change um i think for me i see this project as a, an opportunity to I was given an opportunity to learn the mistakes so that I can do better um, for the next project. So that's why I wouldn't change much because I think I've learned a lot about myself, um, my leadership style, my project management style, the things I enjoy doing and don't enjoy doing, um, interacting, connecting with people. So I've learned a lot as an academic, but 
I think even beyond the project, I've learned really about this academic profession. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of questions that through doing uh, or leading this research project, I got to answer. Um, and it really boils down to you have to decide what matters, why you do the work that you do, and that sort of sets the tone for moving forward. So I am grateful, um, really, to have been given this opportunity because I always thought um, that I have to be a full professor to ever lead a project. So because I have this opportunity as an early, early career academic, I will take these experiences. Otherwise, there would be no lessons to share uh, if everything was perfect. So I'm trying to say that not everything was perfect, not everything went well, but that's why I learned lessons. And it is these lessons that I will take forward to my next research project again. Thank you so much. That's a really lovely point to end on. Um, so thank you all of you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. I can see from, from the chat that people have been finding it really valuable and have learned a lot from it. So I really can't thank you enough. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our audience here for coming today, contributing such interesting questions and, and being so engaged in this discussion with us. Um, as you can see in the chat, we have a webinar uh, next, uh, no, ne not next month, in December, uh, December, which I'll be running, which will be looking at building research teams. Uh, and we'll, we'll work through a little bit more some tips on, on how, to, you know, how to manage and build your research team. If you would like to learn more about the Worldwide Universities Network and hear about upcoming events and book yourself onto them, go to their website at wun.ac.uk. And um, WUN will put the recording of today's discussion on their YouTube channel soon. So if you want to listen to this all over again, if you had a wonderful time and want to listen to, back to all the highlights, then it will be available for all of you soon. So thank you so much again to our three panellists, Calvin, Alessia and Natalie. You have been absolutely wonderful. Um, and Natalie, I realise it's now extremely, extremely late where you are. So no <laughs> doubt you'll be so ready for bed. Um, but thank you all so much. Have a wonderful week. And thank you so much for coming along today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.